Hazikon, this great feast of the summer that we celebrate for the remission of the Mother of God. Of course, it's sort of the climactic feast of the feast of the Mother of God. And around the world, it's celebrated with great fanfare and great zeal. I remember vividly at St. Tikhon's, we do the procession with the wine sheet around the church and walking under the Mother of God's protection after singing the Lamentations. One of the hottest churches you would ever be in. There was no air conditioning at the time up in that choir loft. It was all the heat gathered in one place, and there it was. So, but it was worth it because there was much grace, and you could feel that grace. It was worth bearing that no matter what the struggle was. And that is exactly what the Mother of God did throughout her life. She bore whatever the trials were, whatever the difficulties were. She knew that a sword would pierce her heart, as Simeon foretold her, and indeed it did on the cross, probably. None of us has ever suffered as she did watching her son be crucified because her son was the son of God. And her son was totally innocent and not worthy of such a death, but because of our unworthiness, underwent that that we might be raised up with himself. And the traditions that surround this feast, and there are many, most of them come from the uh, sort of pseudepigraphal sources, but sources which we have baptized in those sections of them. And around the sixth century or so, this feast was already taking off and it was already having many homilies not long thereafter that people like Andrew of Crete and Maximus the Confessor and John Damascene and of course Gergi Palamas are the most famous homilies on this feast. But one of the stories that comes about is that when the apostles were translated through the air there because the mother of God desired to see them one last time before her death, Paul being one of them, which is in the icon, Paul is standing there, there and he says to her, Basically, rejoice in how happy he is because even though I do not see Christ in the flesh, I see him in you, in the person of you. And there's nothing wrong with this statement because it is indeed in her that we do see her son because she lived the life that we are called to live. This is a, another feast of the human person as I talked about a few weeks ago because this is our destiny as well. Indeed, we are all called to be God bearers, assuming the new theologian says we are called to be theotoki. But yet there's only one Theotokos who ever bore Christ in her womb and ever will bear Christ in her womb was worthy of that. She that gave that definitive yes to God from the beginning and followed his will and followed his commandments and was the first to hear that message of the gospel and the first, according to many of the fathers, to hear the message of the resurrection that it had taken place. So the mother of God became that vessel by which many saw her son and saw Christ. And praying for us, not only in that, but in her presence on earth, the way she lived, in her humility, and her meekness, and her quietness in bearing these things, by her way of life, proclaiming Christ. And that is what we are too called to be, to proclaim Christ through our lives, to be transparent to that way of Christ. When we walk in Christ, the living in Christ, Christ shines forth through our hearts, as he's shown forth in the Mother of God, because she is that radiant. When you read the the copies to the Mother of God, which, as our bishop says, is the most sublime expression of theology probably written in any Orthodox hymnography. Every verse of it has to do with Christ. Every single verse makes no sense without Christ. As our beloved Archbishop Dimitri used to always say, that the question is, who do you say that I am? And the rest of it makes sense. The Mother of God makes complete sense because her Son is the second person of the Holy Trinity. Her Son is God and man. Her Son is the Redeemer of the universe. And she, in hearing that first message of the Incarnation, of the Gospel, the Gospel was proclaimed to her. Remember, the Annunciation is Evangelismos, which means the Gospel, the Annunciation in Greek. And that message she took forth and said, May it be unto me according to thy word, and live that way. When she had lived this way for many years after her son's death, living with the Apostle John, being all of our mother in that person, she was appeared to again by the Archangel Gabriel and said that it was time for her to repose. And no, she didn't weep over this. The first thing she does is go out to the Mount of Olives to pray. A good example for us, when we have a crisis coming in our life, we go out to pray. And she was given a palm branch to be carried at her funeral procession, and they, this was given, of course, to the apostles afterwards, and they carried this. But this is also an image of her son, who in palm branches was foreshadowing his death, but also his victory over death in his entry into Jerusalem. 
And here is her victory over death as well in her son because she has that symbol of victory as well. In the icon we see also this famous story of Aphthonius, this Jewish man who was audacious enough, as I said, the audacious hands we just heard, to reach up and try to tip over the beer of the Mother of God. But in doing this, his hands were mystically severed at that point. And he cries out, of course, in grief, and the Apostle Peter heals him at this point through the prayers of the Mother of God and the person of her son, and he becomes a great Christian in this. So this is not some audacious and horrible act by the church. This is a glorious act because sometimes difficulties are what it takes, well, always difficulties are what it takes to bring us to salvation. And the Lord chastises them, those whom he loves. In the end, though, of course, we know in this story, the Tom Thomas in the tradition was late in arriving, and he wanted to see for himself that she had reposed. It was hard for him to believe. And he goes to the tomb, is open, and there the winding sheet is in the same position that it was left, but no body. Our tradition is not dogmatized, but our tradition is that the Mother of God, of course, was raised up in body because death had no rights over her. One who does not sin, death has no rights over them. And because she was the one who heard the first message of the gospel and listened and obeyed, and because she was the one that heard the message of the resurrection and proclaimed this to the world herself, she was given that blessing, of course, to be raised up with himself and to be at his right hand now from eternity. Soon after that, of course, the apostles are having their typical meal when they raise up the bread in behalf of the Savior. At that point, she appears to them and tells them rejoice that her prayers are still with them. And this is the origin of a service that you will see in many monasteries called the Panagia service, the All Holy service, in which the Mother of God is honored in that piece of bread at the end of the trapeze and handed out to the faithful. Some of you have probably seen this in monasteries. There's a wonderful tradition which comes, of course, from this Feast of the Dormition. Then the Mother of God being raised up, we too see an image of ourselves. We are not called to be subject to death for eternity. Death is not natural. Death is wrong. And because that part of us that bears that image and likeness of God is so real, when we come to ourselves, when we find Christ, we realize that this is unacceptable. Death is completely unacceptable in our lives. We must live in that way that we remember death, that we fight actively to be immortal from now, to live as if today was our last, and to live that we would live with Christ in eternity, because as his mother did in following that word, we too will be raised up with himself. Most holy Theotokos, save us.